All right, good evening and welcome to this uh, first session of uh, the Hillsdale College introduction. Oh no, this is actually Constitution 101. And uh, this is the first, uh, the first lecture for the first night. So we've got uh, myself, Gary, uh, Dan and Jason with us to begin with. We'll see if others join us as we move along. Um, brief readings, this, uh, this first lecture, we have the Constitution, the Declaration, uh, and then a, a short piece by Lincoln. Now, of course, with the Constitution, the Declaration, you could pick any paragraph and just go deep and spend the entire night discussing that. Um, I was thinking, I, I want to hear what you guys have to say, but I was thinking we might focus specifically on the uh, passage by Lincoln, um, since we covered the Constitution, the Declaration quite a bit in the past. Uh, the past class and the concept of liberty being so fundamental to the Declaration and the Constitution, I thought it might be useful to, to really dig into that subject and uh, try to understand what it means and what, what it meant to them anyway, what it meant to them and perhaps how that meaning has changed over time. Um, what I've found is that I, I, the deeper I go into the fundamental concepts, it helps me understand the founding generation better and what they were trying to do and all the moving parts that they felt had to be successfully blending together to, to create the machinery of government to run successfully and efficiently and effectively. And so I thought maybe liberty would be a good place to, to start. But in, uh, as I've done before, I'll actually turn it over to you guys first. Um, what thoughts did you have from the, either the video or the readings from, uh, from this week? There's quite a bit there. Yeah, there's quite a bit there that I, I found interesting. I, I, I think it's interesting how uh, formatted the Declaration of Independence is um, and how linked it is to the Constitution. Uh, one of a, a major thing that I learned about this in the video is that the Constitution and the Constitutional Convention, um, I looked in more deeper into James Madison's um, uh, the vices of the political system of the United States. And so before the Constitution was written, there was the Articles of the Confederation, right? And they just weren't working, right? And there was uh, several parts of these Articles of Confederation. Um, there's a link, there's a, a website that um, summarizes um, Madison's uh, The Vices of the Political System, and that was written in 1787. Um, but it gets into failure of the states to comply with constitutional requisites, um, encroachment by the states on the federal authority, uh, violations of the law of nations and of treaties, uh, trespasses of the states on the rights of each other. Um, there, you know, with with me particularly, I I've gotten I, if there's a part of the Constitution that I've landed on as being more, more familiar with than other parts of the Constitution. For me personally, it's Article Four, and um, and that that article really has to do with, you know, Colorado can't be telling Utah um, what to do or, or the states aren't supposed to be conquesting against one another and meddling into one another's affairs. And the ideas too of um, having a sovereign um, populace that was growing at the time uh, Larry R. mentioned that the continent at the time still hadn't been crossed uh, by Lewis and Clark, and so there was really a, you know, there was just kind of a, a blind spot out there, out there, and how do you delegate these little republics and um, to where at once there is individual liberty and at the same time there 
is an obligation to a union, right? Um, some of the other major themes that struck me too was the religious um, it kind of just struck me that many of the people that came from Europe actually almost establish a uh, uh, a religion and almost make it obligatory. So there was a religious zealotry almost. And um, so there were questions about balancing what the place is of religion among uh, government. Thanks, Jason. So, yeah, those are some of the things that I picked up. Cool. How about you, Dan? I I was struck in reading and reading this week. I, I've read them both before, obviously the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, but I'd never read I've never I'd never read them together. You know, in in I didn't sit down at the same time, but within a twenty four hour period, I'd read them both, and that was the first time I'd ever done that. And I was struck. I think the thing that stood out to me most. Uh, at least to me, at least I remember being described to me in, you know, eighth grade civics or whatever it was that the, the Declaration of Independence is the why and the Constitution is the how. And I, I've always liked that little formula, but I, I was it, it, it was brought home to me this week, how much the Constitution builds off the Declaration, that the, Decla the, the Declaration kind of starts us on a certain path and it's in the Constitution then, you know, is, is the not fulfillment, that's the wrong word of the path that the declaration begins. But I love how the constitution builds off of the foundation that was begun by the declaration. That was really brought home to me. Um, I, I'm always struck, we have a family tradition on the 4th of July that after we do our barbecue and everything else, we sit down and we read it every year. Uh, and every time I read it, I'm struck by, um, What's the best way to say this? I'm, I'm, I'm struck by how solidly founded it is. Um, and you can talk about, you know, Locke and all the stuff that came before. Um, but to me, I think it still remains the most clear outline of what a government is supposed to do. And then obviously what it's not supposed to do when we start talking about King George and, you know, the, the uh, however many, many paragraphs it is on the, you know, the laundry list of, of, of abuses. Um, I, I still, I still am blown away by the document. Um, but I do love how the constitution takes it to the next level. Um, and I was struck again by the thought, this is the thought that I've had before. Um, um, in addition to the obvious need for amendments as, as things change over time, that the, it's implicit in the constitution that it's, that the work isn't finished. The, the declaration put us on a path and the constitution gave us a framework to continue down that path, but it's, it's left unfinished, um, that there's work for us to do, to continue on, to continue on. That, those are the, those are the, the main thoughts that I walked away with this week in, from the readings. Great. One of the, uh, thing that I'm most struck with, with those two documents is how every word and phrase is born of at least that I've the ones that I've dug into, they're born of that they're, they're packed. They are packed. They there is a there are deep roots. These are not shallowly, they're, they're, they're not, they're not shallow in their usage of these words. There's deep meaning, deep. I mean, people even giving their lives, like Aldrin and Sydney dying, you know, being being beheaded for his discourses on government. Where he was, where he was, you know, 200 years earlier, 200 years, 100 years, 150 years earlier, before the the founding, because of his um, rejection of the divine right of kings and how the sovereignty was really in the people, um, you know that that they, 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 these roots go run really deep. And this week, I last course, I dug really deep into the pursuit of happiness concept, which we'll be able to hit, I think, more next week because there's there's the, the state constitutions that we read for next week's or two weeks from now's reading. Um, over and over again, you see that life, liberty, property, pursuit of happiness in all these state constitutions. It's like those those weren't trite phrases to them. They meant something very specific. What did they mean? Um, 
in the last year, so I went and looked at the Utah State High School curriculum for civics. And it doesn't, it leaves all of that out. It starts at the Declaration and Constitution and then moves forward, you know, goes through Supreme Court cases in American history and so forth. But it doesn't, it doesn't go, it, there's a whole missing chapter, there's a whole missing section prelude that explains the why behind those two documents and what all those, you know, diving deep into those two words, into those, into the words, into those words and those concepts. And I think the most rewarding thing for me in, so far in this course and in the course before was taking the time to dig into those concepts. What, what did they mean by liberty? And what did they mean by pursuit of happiness? Um, so that's what, that's what Lincoln seems to be doing. If we look at his writing, you know, he's got the fragment on the constitution and the union. This is, he never actually spoke this. He just wrote it and then never actually gave it. But it's all about, you know, this idea of liberty. The, the principle that clears the path for all gives hopes to all, hope to all, and by consequence, enterprise and industry to all, is what Lincoln says. This is on page 67 of the reader. And it's just this brief little, not even one page thing. What, so it's like the, 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 this idea of liberty is the core that the, I guess the declaration, he saw the declaration as, um, but this, this idea of liberty is this core thing that those two documents are trying to, to protect. What, what do you guys understand to be, what is liberty? What is this idea of liberty? And we sing about it, you know, it's in our Declaration of Independence, it's in, you know, it's on our flags, it's, you know, it's all, it's all around us. What did they mean by liberty? What do you guys understand of that? What, what I see here too, is something that he goes into it in the document that, that answers that in part is this apple of gold on a uh, silver plate, right? And he compares the uh, Declaration of Independence um, and there it is, right? It's, uh, you know, this, this idea that we're all sovereign and that we can, it kind of opens, it opens the gate to where every common, the common man is capable of achieving their full potential, right? And uh, so, you know, but yeah, he talks about the the uh, apple of gold um, surrounded by the, the the silver plate. He compares the silver plate to the Constitution, and the apple apple of gold sits on that. And you know, it's it's very interesting, you know, just just where what Dan was saying there with all of these, um, what's the word? just the uh, des despotism of King George III, all of those things that had go on, gone on through those dynasties. And, and I think what you were saying there too, uh, Gary, is how deep that stuff is, right? And if you actually go back to the history and you're standing there and you're looking at somebody like King George III and um, that monarchy has been so... Uh, it's passed through generations and you're looking at this real human being. To me, I almost would compare it to like Pharaoh or something, right? Pharaoh was considered to be a deity. And so these guys were just so in tune with what a government should not look like, right? Um, just King George was just doing all of these manipulative, super manipulative things and just arbitrary and abusive. They didn't have the right to speak how they wanted to speak. And um, that's another thing that Larry Arn touches on too, is the power to, I, I believe he hit on the, uh, the capacity that we have to speak is separated from animals, right? And mankind, and also to speak across distances and, um, and also, the power of government to force too, which has been a kind of a new concept for me um, as we've learned about these things. I, I listened to a uh, Mike Lee talking with uh, Jordan Peterson interview. I don't know if you've ever that seen it. That was a great that. interview. Yeah, I listened to that. Yeah, and it was interesting to me that he brought up force so like 
quickly into that conversation, right? And and you know, it it goes back to those uh, articles of confederation where the government wasn't holding itself accountable. It wasn't it wasn't holding water, and so so the constitution was written to limit the government so that the government can't breach our individual liberty. And, but then it also goes, goes into talking about how, you know, if men were angels, um, we wouldn't need a government. And if government wasn't force, at the end of the day, there's no reason for it, right? If it doesn't, if it doesn't hold, hold water. Which was the problem with the Articles of Confederation or one of the problems. How about you, Dan? What is, what is your definition of liberty? What did, what did you understand they understood liberty to mean? It, uh, it's, it's such a fantastic question and, and, and really a great, great topic because um, I think the word means different things to different people. I think, I think, I think each of us, or at least in my experience, everybody, everybody thinks they know what liberty is and thinks that everyone else has the same definition of it. Um, and, I, and I don't know that that's necessarily true. I think liberty can mean different things to different people, depending on your, obviously on your life experiences. Um, my understanding of the concept is simply my God-given right to determine my own destiny. Um, and I think, I, I think for the most part, that's what the founders thought that it was. Um, mm -hmm this idea that we're all um, as, as children of God, um, uh, part, of, part, of, part of our destiny is to determine our own destiny. And obviously we surrender some of that, you know, uh, some of that liberty uh, to exist in, you know, in the society, I pay taxes that I don't want to, you know, any more than anyone else does. Um, but I want roads and national defense and all the other things that come comes along with being an American. And so, so I give that up. Um, and I think the founders understood that too. I, I, I think certainly in that transition from the articles of confederation to the constitution, they understood that, um, 100%, you know, self-determination wasn't a possibility anymore. Um, and so Liberty, I don't think is, um, is anarchy it's not it's not I, it's not being able to do whatever you want but it's um being able for the most part to govern yourself um that's always been that that self-government aspect of it has at least for me has always been an important part that's not talked about nearly enough um that again implied in the idea that i'm a free person is the idea that with that freedom comes a responsibility for me to govern myself, you know, in an appropriate manner. Um, and I don't know that everybody, you know, again, I, I, I think it's a concept that everybody thinks that everyone else thinks more or less the same thing about. And I don't know that it's always true. I think especially people, I think especially people coming here from, from different places have a different idea of what it should be and, and, what, it, and what it is. Very good. Um, <clears throat> you're 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 channeling James Stewart Mill in your conception of what people think. People thinking that way, everyone else thinks the same way that they do. He he talks. I do it naturally. Like, he and I are connected. <laughs> he uh, he has a he has an essay called On Liberty where he talks about exactly that. Um, I think it would be if it's all right with you guys, I'd like to explore what the the the, the thought leaders leading up to the founding said about liberty. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe start with, you know, actually present day. Uh, this is a quote out of uh, uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, for the Supreme Court majority opinion from 1992. As you all know, between the time our last class ended and this class started, we had a pretty significant possibly event where um, the Supreme Court may overturn Roe versus Wade. And so I listened to a, a, a lecture that someone gave where they talked about the history of Roe versus Wade and then Planned Parenthood versus Casey. and. I didn't realize this, but apparently Planned, versus, Planned Parenthood versus Casey attempted to retain the outcome of Ro, Roe v. Wade, but got the interior and put in a new justification for it. They didn't like the justification under Roe v. Wade, and so they gave it a new one. And, and one of the things that they said in there, this is a quote from the majority opinion, is 
At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. And from that definition, one of the things that sprang is, you know, if you can, you know, abortion, or the right to abortion is one of the things you yourself can define as being part of liberty. Um, and so who are we to differ from that? And so I think I thought that, that that being, and I think that, that that kind of jives with some of what you were saying there, Dan, and is probably what is the zeitgeist of our day, I meaning what a lot of people feel about liberty. And I think it would be that that serves as a good baseline to compare the the line of thinking from the founding and then to, then come back and look at this and say, did they think the same way? Because this is this is very subjective. That's a very yeah. subjective statement. Yep. Did the founding generation and those who led up to it have a subjective view of liberty? I think would be worth you know exploring because your definition of liberty is going to change the type of government you create, mm -hmm. you know, to, to enforce that liberty. You know, Marx has a particular definition of liberty and the governments that flow from him, his definition are very, very different than Western governments that flow from a very different um, definition. What I, so what I did is I, I jumped into Locke, his second treatise on government, and then, as I, and I've read it before, but I, I read, I started over at the beginning and he says, and so I just proved this. I'm like, wait, 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 what did, what did you prove? And it turns out, of course, that there's a first treatise on government that far few, fewer people read. We always read the second treatise on government. So I'm like, well, what? I, I, I don't, I want to understand what he was arguing in the first treatise on government. And what it was, it was a refutation, the entire, so the second treatise, of course, builds on the first treatise, but no one reads the first treatise. Kind of like most people read Aristotle's ethics, but they don't read Aristotle's, I'm sorry, they read Aristotle's politics, but they don't read Aristotle's ethics, which is the prelude. And you've mm -hmm. got to read the prelude. So I jumped into that. I'm like, what was happening there? And, and what was happening is he was, he was refuting the entire first treatise is a refutation of this guy named Sir Robert Filmer, who was a proponent of the divine, divine right of kings. That's what the first treaty says, is saying, no, the divine right of kings is wrong. And he's not the only one who did that. Um, Algin and Sidney, uh, let's see if I can find his little, he's somewhere in here too. Algin and Sidney, he's the one who got beheaded. His, he, wrote, he wrote that, he wrote his discourses on government and then got, it was used as a witness against him at his own trial because he, he was accused of treason and then he was beheaded. Um, Anyway, he, he said stuff like, you know, that this Sir Robert, because Algernon Sidney also wrote a refutation of Sir Robert Filmer and it got him killed. He wrote it 10 years earlier. Uh, Filmer wrote this, this thing, his thing in, in 1680. Um, Algernon Sidney refuted him in about uh, 1681, 82 and was beheaded as a result in 1683. And, um, Algernon and Sidney gave a short refutation of the divine right of kings. Um, John Locke went bonkers on it and wrote like 60, 70 pages refutation and goes line by line through Sir Robert Filmer's um, defense of the divine right of kings and shows where he's wrong. And Robert Filmer, his whole defense of the divine right of kings is entirely biblical. He, he, he starts at Adam and goes through all of the patriarchy of king, of the fathers, you know, of, of, of the generations all through the Bible and establishes through that how, because Adam was the first, he had absolute power and everyone after that, every, every king after that also had absolute power. Uh, it's like basically the right of the fathers, whoever the father is has absolute, absolute power. And you can, you can walk through that first treatise. There's a bunch of, a uh, bunch of great quotes in there. Um, you know, law is nothing but the whim, uh, of, of the, is the, nothing but the will of him that hath the power of the Supreme Father, it is God's ordinance, again, God, divine right of kings. So, so uh, and this is where, this is where Algernon and Sidney comes in. Um, but that's the first treatise. He's spending, he spends, he then, so, so Locke goes through, goes through the Bible to refute the divine right of kings and to show how man is, sovereign himself that man is is equal on an equal playing field with each other 
under God. And so that idea of individual, the sovereign individual comes from the Judeo-Christian Judeo um, tradition through Locke. That's, that's, where, we, that's where we get that from, uh, the, the idea that man is sovereign. And I, there's a whole bunch of uh, great quotes that we could go over. I don't think we'll have time to. Um, let's see. Yeah, he, he, he like just mocks. He mocks that guy. That he's he, anyway. It's just it's really interesting to read what he has to say. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can skip through some of these. So he was trying to establish to whom do I owe obeisance, if anyone. And what he decided, and this is where he jumps finally into the second treatise, after, after refuting the divine right of kings and establishing that man is sovereign in himself by God through the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's, it's, I mean, he's just quoting scripture after scripture in the first treatise over and over again. He then decides or declares that all men are naturally in a state of perfect freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they think fit within the bounds of the law of nature. So there are bounds to that freedom without asking leave or depending upon the will of any other man. A state also of equality, wherein all the power and jurisdiction is reciprocal, no one having more than another. And the use of their faculty should also be equal once amongst each other without subordination or subjection, unless the Lord and master of them all, which is God, should by any manifest declaration of his will set one above. In other words, until God comes and says, all right, this person here is going to be your leader, which did happen in the Bible from time to time. He's saying, we're all equal. There is no divine right one over another. And that's where we get the, you know, the idea of the, this, um, yeah, the, the sovereign individual, uh, the sovereign, the sovereignty of the individual. Um, let's see, there was some great stuff about equality. Let me see if I can find it. And this, this goes to what uh, something you said, Dan. Though this be a state of liberty, yet it is not a state of license. That's interesting. There's a, there is some sort of a law governing our liberty. Though man in that state have an uncontrollable liberty to dispose of his person and possessions, yet he has not liberty to destroy himself or so much as any creature in his possession, but where some nobler use than its bare preservation calls for it. The state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, which obliges everyone. And reason, which is that law, teaches all mankind who will but consult it, that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, liberty, health, liberty, or possessions. For man, being all the workmanship of one omnipotent and infinitely wise maker, all the servants of one sovereign master, sent into the world by his order and about his business, they are his property, whose workmanship they are. So it's like, okay, we, we're getting this. He's building the case for man is free. He has liberty. He has a quality with his, with his fellow man, but he's subservient to a higher law made by God. And that, that kind of, that takes us back to uh, Cicero. Where's my little Cicero thing? Cicero talked about this in 60 BC. He, he identified, as did Aristotle, that there's this law outside of man that we can detect, we can feel, we can sense through our reason. Aristotle talked a lot about reason too. And he said it's that true law, that true law is right reason, consonant with nature, spread through all people, constant and eternal, the source of the duties that we feel the first deterrent of crime, intelligible all by all. We don't have to have anyone interpret it for us. We can feel it consistent everywhere and at all times. So we're getting this, and, and they read, you know, they read Cicero, you know, they, um, Jefferson in particular. So there's, there's this idea that what we're learning, what I'm seeing here is that liberty is not subjective. It's actually, there, it's actually governed by a higher law and our human laws must be in harmony with it. This is still Cicero and cannot abrogate any part of it. Our own laws cannot release us from it. God is the master and general of all people, the author, expander, and mover of this law. And individuals who disobey true law are in exile from themselves and scorn their nature as human beings and will pay the greatest penalties even if all other punishments are escaped. Meaning that 
when we disobey this higher law that exists outside ourselves, the suffering occurs internally. We ourselves suffer by, by not obeying that law or God himself will at some point, you know, uh, judge us. But this is all from On the Commonwealth by Cicero. And this idea of true law existing outside of man, you see it all throughout Locke. You see him referring back to this idea that there's something outside of man, um, which to me is, that's fascinating. So here's that, though this may be a state of liberty, it's not a state of license. Why? Because we're subject to that external law, but we have, we can choose whether we obey it or not, but we're constantly sensing within ourselves whether we are acting in accordance with it and we are you know and this whole idea is just fascinating you know that we are his property we're his workmanship we're subservient to whatever law it is that he is he's dictating to us he also thought that god has certainly appointed government to restrain the partiality and violence of men that you know not everyone's going to obey that true law people are going to try to um act unjustly towards one another and that government is the means by which we band together to for self-defense for example let's see let me pop through here a couple here that rule of the right rule of reason that's that that's the, that's a lot that's uh, cicero coming through right there besides the crime which consists in violating the law and varying from the right rule of reason that's right out of aristotle and cicero whereby a man so far becomes degenerate so that how do you become degenerate if liberty is subjective it's whatever i decide how can you possibly become degenerate so locke i think does not agree with an, the idea of a subjective sense of liberty that liberty is actually there's an objective sense of liberty declares himself to quit the print whereby a man so far becomes degenerate and declares himself to quit the principles of human nature to be a noxious creature there is commonly injury done to some person or another and some other man receives damage by his transgression da, 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 da. so this and this goes back to aristotle where aristotle talked about man can be the highest thing and he can also be a beast he, he when he's when he's at his best he's all, he's like approaches the angels and when he's at his worst he's worse than the beast because he has he has actually he has his mind he can actually do worse than the beasts do um, that's interesting to me. So we've got, again, that right rule of reason, that external standard, external law. When we act against it, we are degenerate and we are quitting ourselves from the principles of human nature, become noxious. So to me, this is painting a picture of what liberty means to him, uh, to, to, uh, to Locke, who Jefferson took a lot of this from. Again, renouncing reason, the common rule and measure God hath given to mankind. Um, and this is, this, is, this is very relevant, I think, to our day. Although I have said above in the prior chapter that all men by nature are equal, I cannot be supposed to understand all sorts of equality. Age or virtue can give someone you know, virtue or uh, benefit over another. Excellency of parts and merits may place others above the common level. Birth may subject some alliance or benefits to others. To pay an observance to those who have nature, gratitude, other respects may have made it due. So we are not born equal. We are not born, we are born equal before God and with one another before the law, but in all other ways, we're very unequal. That's that is that idea right now is quite in dispute in our society. You could, you could, um, and that and that's natural. That's that's like the, that's natural. It's we it's that's that in, in our day and age, it seems to me that that state of, that lack of equality is very much frowned upon. He's saying, and so did Aristotle, that that state of inequality is natural. What we do about it, we can have a conversation, but it's, it's natural to be in, unequal. Anyway, so far, what are, your, what are your thoughts about what Locke is saying as he's progressing through his thought process here on equality, freedom, liberty, law, um, we're starting to see what government, what type of government might need to be formed around these concepts. What are your thoughts there? I, uh, I, I, I think I'm very much like everyone else. I, at least three or four times between college and law school, had to read the second treatise. Never even occurred to me to read the first one. <laughs> if yes. you had asked me if the first one existed, I probably would have had to think about it. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> and now it kind of makes me want to go back and read it. Um, I, 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 uh, on a purely personal, you know, this is what I believe. I, 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 I think Locke is right. I think, um, I, and not only do I agree with him, but I also like the way he, the way he, you know, uh, proselytes, if you will, for, for, for his beliefs. Um, maybe it's because it was the last thing you said, but I'm, 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 I'm processing in my head this idea that, um, um, that it's okay that we're not equal. Um, we're equal under God, we're equal under the law. Um, I, I, it is, it is, it, it, if, if, if the, if, and now I'm also wondering if I would be saying this out loud, if it wasn't three white men, you know, having this conversation, <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> um, and I want to dig into that my, feeling you're having, Dan, no, I want to, no, I don't, don't want to, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to go around on this one, like, because it is, uh, I, uh, again, I spent a, uh, I spent a good portion of my youth in the rural South. In, um, you know, this is Mississippi in the 1980s, which is roughly the rest of the country in the 1880s, um, <laughs> uh, including the public education system, by the way. Um, yeah. And it was very, uh, I, you know, growing up in an environment where it was very obvious that people were different were treated differently by society and still by the law um simply because of a characteristic that they inherited at birth yeah. um and it, it, part of part of me still clings on to that old you know the, the 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 old justification which is literally what we were taught as kids that that was god's decision um and if he, and, and literally had he, what we were told was if he had wanted us all to be equal, he would have just made us all white. And well, or I brown think, or whatever, well, you know, yes. yeah. yeah. But, and I certainly, certainly, I think now in hindsight, I disagree pretty strongly with that idea, but I also don't think that it's the, you know, we can get into the, uh, off on a tangent on is it the role of the government to make us all equal? you know, to, to correct all those wrong. And I don't know that we want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, this this course I, will take us there. This course will take us down that rabbit hole, just so you know. All right. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, gotta, I gotta work some stuff out in my head then. Yeah, and, and it's and it's good because, and, and this is not to say that this is where the conversation ends at all. It's really where it starts. It's saying that yeah. equality is, inequality is the natural state of man. Now, Aristotle had some very clear things to say about what we do about that. And so does Christianity, for example. Mm -hmm. And so does Marx. They all yeah. of these ideologies have very clear solutions, proposed solutions to the, to the problem of inequality. All that Locke is saying is that the, the natural state of man is that it exists. Yeah. 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 And I certainly think he's right. I, yeah. I don't know what we do uh, about that. We have yes. to have a conversation. Yeah. yeah the, the, yeah. Yeah. This is just the beginning. Because really all of every conversation to a certain extent about government is how are we dealing with that situation? Exactly. Yeah. Because it's, is, it's, it's definitely exists. Yeah. Which is why to me this, this course and digging into these readings is so important because they give us a grounding of is, is he right? If so, what do I, what do, I do with that? What, what do, do I do about, about that? that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, here's, here's just another one from, you know, this, this has all been second treatise, by the way. There was a few at the beginning that were first treatise, but the, the first treatise is all just Bible, 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 Bible. Mm -hmm. There's less Bible in second treatise because he's already dealt with it all. But yeah. he's saying, you know, here that, you know, govern his actions. We're, we're supposed to govern our actions according to the dictates of the law of reason, which God has implanted in him. Again, that's Cicero and Aristotle, Greek. That's Greek thinking mixed with christian judeo-christian mm -hmm. thinking and they're like super compatible so far uh, is what i'm what i've been seeing um let's see he also again liberty and law go together right because law can be used to it sounds like there's several different meanings of law one one meaning of law is cicero's meaning of law which is that there's this higher law outside of mankind that we are supposed to be obedient to and that all human laws have to be in harmony with 
-hmm. And then Locke has this to say about law. He says law in its true notion is not so much about the limitation as the direction of a free and intelligent agent to his proper interest. I think he's talking about the Cicero type of law here. Prescribes no farther than it is, no, maybe not, because here we start talking about prescription. Prescribes no farther than it is for the general good of those under that law. Could they be happier without it? The law as a useless thing would itself vanish, and that ill deserves the name of confinement, which hedges us in only the bogs and precipices. You got to read this like six times to really make sense of it. <laughs> the end of law is not to abolish or restrain, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. It's supposed to keep us in the way of that true law. Liberty mm -hmm. is to be free from restraint and violence from others, which cannot be where there is no law. But freedom is not, as we are told, a liberty for every man to do what he lists, for who could be free when every other man's humor might domineer over him, but a liberty to dispose and order as he lists his person, actions, possessions, and his whole property within the allowance of those laws under which he is. Which laws are those? It's the Cicero laws. It's the Cicero true law concept. So again, we're liberty within a, a certain sphere is what I'm seeing Locke. That's the picture I'm seeing Locke paint. Is he, is he, is he trying, I'm, let me make sure my mind is grasping this the right way. Is he, for, for example, I can't drive 200 miles an hour in my neighborhood. My freedom is, my liberty is restricted to the extent that I can't drive 100 miles past a school. Is what he's saying that we're exchanging, where was the sentence I was looking at? Da, 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 da. A liberty for made every man to do what he lists. Is, is, he's, he's, he's saying, yes, our liberty is restricted by law, but those laws free us from certain things. And so it's, 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 in the, it's a net positive in the end. Is that the point he's trying to make? I think he's saying that in its true notion, so law properly written, law properly written is not so much a limitation as the direction of free and intelligent interest, an agent in his true proper interest. So like driving 200 miles an hour, that's really that the, the speed limit, presumably if it's in it, a law in its true notion, it's helping us stay within our own proper interest, the safety of ourselves and others. Okay. Something I'll say about this, and I, I think if, if you were to look into the mind of Abraham Lincoln, right? And what he would have been dealing with, with the common culture of that time, obviously, um, in the fragments of on the Constitution, he he says is uh, that something that something is the principle of liberty to all, right? The principle that clears the path for all, gives hope to all, and by consequence enterprise and industry to all. And something that comes to my mind with this is putting ourselves in his, wrapping our minds around what Lincoln would have been dealing with. What I've seen a lot lately, I've, I've mentioned it before, but the drama triangle of the victim, persecutor, rescuer, sometimes there really are victims. And I think that the slavery during the time of um, Lincoln, was a case where there really were victims. And, uh, but then also what I've seen a lot lately is where these principles of liberty, I have, uh, you know, individuals in my life who, um, you know, define themselves as libertarians. And um, I, you know, this, this principle of inter individual liberty um, I think what can happen is that I see that it can it can drift from the scales of of mercy and justice, and um, I think it's what Lincoln would have been dealing with because if we don't hold ourselves, if we don't have justice within ourselves, and we don't hold ourselves accountable to um, higher laws, really, um, we're not going to be free. Right, we're we're going to become vice to our own selves, and that's that's kind of where it talks about um, how we don't really have. It's I, I think suicide is a it's it's a criminal act, right? Um, and so if if we don't have if we don't balance that justice and mercy within ourselves, 
um, we're not really, we're not free. Mm. Right? It's kind of a, a mirage. It's a false idea of freedom. I think that goes into like moral issues. I think it goes into like drug addictions and stuff like that. And it goes back to Aristotle too with the, the concept of virtue. Yeah. Right? Which I think Without we're going to hit quite a bit in, in, in two weeks. You know, I was thinking of oh, you know, America the Beautiful, the song where it says, God, mend thine every flaw, confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law, you know. Um, oh, where did it go? Oh, that's weird. Where did my share screen go? The uh, in, in Locke, Second Treatise is always also where we get the idea that um, in, a, in a state of nature, man has a right to self-defense against people's harming his life, liberty, or property, but that in a state of society, we, we quit that natural power. We resign it to the hands of the community. We delegate that right of self-defense to the state. The community becomes the empire. That's, that's the right that we, that's what we give up. That, or we, 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 we have, and it's in here or, or in another quote, but we have the ability for self-defense if the law is out of our reach. Like if someone's in our house right now and the police aren't here, we can, we can self-defend. Yeah. But if at all possible, the use of force in self-defense is delegated entirely to the state. We get that idea from Locke. Um, go can ahead. I, I don't want to, I don't want to derail you if you're taking us on a specific course, but I, I, there was a question that just popped into my head. Yeah. In, in, in Locke and elsewhere, it's life, liberty, and property. Yeah. And Jefferson changes it to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What, what do you think is the significance of that change? That is a great question. And we're going to spend all of our next session on that exact question. Oh, well, yeah. I'm just ahead of the game. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> I, I wondered the same thing. I'm like, what's, what's the deal with happiness? What, why is that a thing? And I, I took a deep dive in that one, and it was one of the most rewarding, ex, you know, several weeks of my life to get, to understand what the heck they were talking about. So I'm excited to to dig into that because that's that's actually the subject, or at least it keeps popping up in the readings for the next the next uh, the next lecture. You just keep seeing that over and over again: life, liberty, happiness, life, liberty, mm -hmm. property, happiness. What's up with this happiness thing? So yeah, um, we'll uh, we'll spend that hour, I think, really digging into that uh, next time. Good. Good. Yeah. Um, so again, here he says, uh, by, we consent, uh, we put ourselves on an obligation to submit to the determination of the majority to do what? It's really that right to self-defense of life, liberty, property. Again, that's, that's straight out of Locke. Um, now, this, now this is interesting. So you've got Locke on the whole second treatise of government. Before he wrote that, he wrote the first treatise and he also wrote a letter concerning toleration. Uh, the year before, 1689, where we get some other fascinating concepts that are part and parcel of our society even today, but I don't think we realize that they come from Locke. He talks about, so in, in the second treatise on government, he talks about government. In this one, he talks about religion, and there's this just very interesting blend. He said, the true the business of true religion is quite another thing. It is not instituted in order to the erecting of an external pomp, nor the obtaining of ecclesiastical dominion, nor the exercise of compulsive force, but to the regulating of men's lives according to the rules of virtue and piety. Whosoever will list himself under the banner of Christ must in the first place and above all things make war upon his own lusts and vices. It is in vain for any man to usurp the name of Christian without holiness of life, purity of manners, benignity and meekness of spirit. Let every man, everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So it's like, what are you, what are you supposed to have liberty to, what is liberty for? It's for this. It's to make war upon your own lusts and vices. And that is right out of Aristotle. That is right out of Aristotle's ethics. And it's right out of Judeo-Christian, the Judeo-Christian ethic. So it's like, what is liberty for? It's for that. Can it be coerced? No, it's religion. There's, there's, there is not, it's not for the exercise of a compulsive force. And he spends the next while talking about that. Um, the toleration of those that differ from, so this is where this, this idea of tolerance that we have in our society, I think it comes straight out of lock. The toleration of those that differ from others in matter of religion is so agreeable 
to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to the genuine reason of mankind that it seems monstrous for men to be so blind as to not perceive the necessity and advantage of it in so clear a light. So what other religion can you think of? What other ideology, even, and I'm talking about broad use of the word religion, theistic and and non-theistic worldviews. What other worldview expressly, at least in the eyes of Locke, expressly allows and encourages, even demands of its adherence, tolerance of those with other ideologies. Like if you, I've been studying uh, for the last two years, um, identity Marxism. It is absolutely intolerant Mm -hmm. of individuals, of people with different ideologies. It demands uniformity. This is a, this, This idea is, I think, foundational to the idea of liberty within America. It's where we get the idea of separation of church and state. They, I mean, he he himself, in one of these quotes, um, yeah, I esteem it above all things necessary to distinguish exactly the business of civil government from that of religion and to settle the just bounds that lie between the one and the other. So all through first and second treaties, you've got this Judeo-Christian, boom, 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 you know, Jesus Christ, Christianity, da, 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 da. And then he says, they have to be separate. They have to be, you, we're not going to create a church government. You have to create a civil government that has these, that life, liberty, property. And then outside of that, religion is all about, let's see, where's the quote? Persuasion. Um, he has all these, oh yeah. Inward persuasion of the mind. It's all, there's the, you know, the full persuasion of the mind. No, it appears that not, it appears not that God has ever given any such authority to one man over another as to compel anyone to his religion. It's all about persuasion. It's all about people have to believe for themselves. Um, and so the, the duties under which liberty, we're supposed to use our liberty for, cannot be compelled. They have to be um, convinced. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, there's additional ones that I just pulled out. James Otis was saying the same thing um, at the same time. And maybe to bring all this kind of to a close, because we're getting close to our, our time here. Um, oh, there's just, I mean, Edmund Burke had some great stuff to say. Thomas Jefferson, let's see. This, this one right here, this, this, led, this was a letter to Henry Lee 50 years after the declaration. Um, this was, this was a, a real mocker for me. The question was, where did you get the ideas for the declaration? Where'd you get that? Where'd you get all this stuff? He said, we didn't, it wasn't to find out new principles or new arguments never thought of, not merely to say things which had never been said before, but to place before mankind the common sense of the subject in terms so plain and firm as to command their assent and to justify ourselves in the independent stand we are compelled to take. Neither aiming at originality of principle or sentiment, nor yet copied from any particular or previous writing, it was intended to be an expression of the American mind and to give to that expression the proper tone of spirit called for by the occasion. All its authority of the Declaration of Independence rests then on the harmonizing sentiments of the day, whether expressed in conversation, in letters, printed essays, or in the elementary books of public right as Aristotle, Cicero, Locke, and Sidney. Those four authors, you've, I think you've got to dig deep. You've got to dig deep into those four in particular if you want to understand what Jefferson was getting at in the Declaration of Independence. I had no idea until I took the prior course to this one. I had no idea. I thought he was just some brilliant guy who came up with all this on his own. Turns out, no, he had been studying Greek since he was like six years old and went, he, he read Aristotle's ethics. He read politics. He read Cicero. He, 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 he knew Locke. He knew Sidney. And the idea of liberty that Lincoln talks about in his fragment come from these four and others. And we, as Americans, I, we've got to study that stuff if we're going to have an understanding of what kind of government do you build based on the concept of liberty? And if you change the concept of liberty, like the Supreme Court did, what does that do to our government? Maybe one last quote from, um, from Jefferson, the God who gave us life gave us liberty at the same time. What kind of liberty did he give us? It's the kind that Lincoln's talking about. How well do we as Americans understand the the definition of that, that liberty and the implications of it?
to me is um, a sobering and worthwhile pursuit to, to, to dig into that. Closing thoughts from you guys on uh, this first lecture. If I'm gonna understand this stuff the way I want to, I am not gonna be able to do anything except read for the next 15 <laughs> years. I've, I've been at it for about, since 2004. Um, but I, but uh, this, this, these Hillsdale courses have really, really turned up the dial for me. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm struck by, and I know we're talking about, you know, hundreds and of years and more. I'm struck by how well the dots are connected between from the Greeks to Cicero, to Sydney, to Locke, to Jefferson, yeah. to Lincoln. Um, yeah. The, 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 um, this is a this is a minor tangent. We sat down on Mother's Day and read love letters that my grandfather wrote to my grandmother, you know, in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And I made the comment afterwards to my children and nephews and nieces of how important it is to write things down. Um, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that Aristotle wrote, Aristotle wrote his stuff down, that Cicero wrote his stuff down, that Locke wrote. It's not enough. You know, it's fun to sit around and, you know, have the chat like we're mm -hmm. doing. But if these guys hadn't written this stuff down, we'd be screwed. Yeah. You know? What if Plato hadn't written down Socrates? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Can you imagine? Yeah. 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 All right. Well, our next uh, two weeks from now, we'll have our, our second lecture. Um, I, I find great meaning in going beyond. Um, I mean, the next one is, is, again, really short readings. I highly recommend. I mean, there's a whole class they teach on, on ethics, Aristotle's ethics. I, I, I'm planning on, if, if you guys are up for it and interested, I'm planning on sharing um, a lot that I've learned from Aristotle's ethics, because you'll see those dots. You'll be like, wait, this stuff was around 2,300 years ago? Because yeah. it goes right up through Cicero. And just, it, 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 it takes that chain even farther back. Um, and uh, to me, it defines like the, the pursuit of happiness, which again today is very subjective, is but, but in Aristotle's words, it's very objective. And Jefferson knew his Aristotle. And that means something, I think. Guys, it's been good. Thank you for your, for your comments. Um, Barry, really Jason, important. thank you guys both. Yeah. Yep. We'll see you in two weeks. Thanks so much. Have a great evening. You too. Yeah. Bye.